here in this country. And Christian people feel that they have been undermined by our courts. If the court uh, does not give any attention to the Constitution, if they ignore the Constitution, with the rulings, and where does that leave us? We feel that we have been uh, cheated and were threatened. Uncertainty of natural disasters, and, and we Christians believe that many of those national, uh, natural disasters are the result of people turning their back on God as well. And we just feel like we're victims. Our voices have been stilled when we try to give a witness. They tell us that we're not politically correct, or worse, that we're violating somebody else's civil rights. If they want to go to hell, they got a civil right to do it. And uh, I said, you know what that all says to me? I said, what I think our message is, you know, we've been talking about these signs, been looking forward to the end all of our life, and now these are the signs that we, when these signs happen, we've been waiting on, now we get act like we're afraid about it. Jesus said, when these signs start happening, lift up your head, for your redemption draweth nigh. And that's my message to you today. If you'd like to turn with me uh, in your Bibles to read the text, we'll be looking at the Gospel of Luke. Chapter number 21, Luke chapter number 21. I'm telling you when the, the message of Satan to the church is you need to sit down and shut up. I'm here to tell you that our message is this is our finest hour. This is when the light shines the brightest, is in the hour of darkness. And it's time for the church to, under the anointing and the empowering of the Holy Spirit, just to let our light shine. In the, in the uh, Gospel of Luke, chapter number 21, I'm going to begin reading with verse number 25. And Jesus is in the middle of a discourse. This, all, this whole discourse would be relevant to our talk today, but I'm just going to begin reading with verse 25 where Jesus says, And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars. I was sitting in the Sunday school class today, and um, Richard has brought to our attention that whatever we talk about in Sunday school tends to come up again in the worship service. And um, so I, they, they told me what we're going to be talking about this morning, and I said, Well, Richard, relax. We're not going to be repeating the Sunday school class today. But we got further into the class, and lo and behold, we were, we were back on uh, some of this. But um, I noticed as I was looking over my notes to compare to what we were talking today that I left out something very important. And if I get through preaching this and find out that I stumbled and did not get on this, you might get a reprisal of this message uh, at the end because I think it's one of the most important things that I can tell you today. But it begins with this. Jesus says there will be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. And on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear, and the expectation of those things which are coming in the earth for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Now, I didn't even realize that this was part of the message, I mean part of the message until it was coming up to Sunday school class today when they said, why are there so many wars? And one of the reasons is because those controlling spiritual forces put in place by the Lord and the balance of spiritual powers as in the princes of Persia that was mentioned in Daniel's revelation and in the princes of Greece that was mentioned in Daniel's dream. Those things are being shaken. Powers that have stood in place, some of them for centuries, have been undermined. And now the enemy has 
use this opportunity to create an unrest in the world. That's, in, in fact, why so many wars in so many different places today. <clears throat> and, of course, the United States is involved in about all of them. But the, but the uh, Lord goes on to say, Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. Uh, the world as we knew it is gone. That is a, a startling realization. And that's not just the voice of a, of a previous generation calling down through the echoes of time. It is a reality even for those that have lived a relatively brief season on the earth. The world that we knew is gone. The, the scripture here talks about powers being shaken. And, the, and it, that means the stability has been compromised. That's why something shakes. Uh, this was illustrated to me yesterday. We had after men's breakfast and uh, kind of filtering out, and, and some of the some of the men, I guess, was having a good time, or they had lawns to mow at home, was trying to avoid it or whatever. I don't know, but they were hanging around. Breakfast was over, and the cook was gone, and and uh, I was still here with the last remnants of the the men, kind of talking and one of them came and grabbed a hold of the cattle pusher that some that uh, that's on the front of my truck and shook it stood up on it and shook it with all of his might not much might but it's all he had and but it was enough that that uh, cattle guard on the front of the truck rattled and shook I went over and got out of, got out of the truck went over and looked underneath there and a bolt had come loose and a, and a weld had uh, broken loose on it. I had no idea it was that way. I know now that when my daughters borrowed my truck last week, before they returned it to me, they ran it into something. But they didn't bother to mention that to me because they went and looked at it and they couldn't see any damage. They said, Dad will never know. Not realizing that they had knocked a bolt out and knocked a, knocked, had broken a uh, weld. Haven't talk, by the way, this is the first they're hearing about this. They don't know that I found that out yet. But, but at any rate, the, the book of Hebrews says in the 12th chapter, in uh, virtually the same verses as we read as a text from the uh, 21st chapter of, of Luke, it's from Hebrews chapter 12 beginning with verse 25. Paul is talking about things being shaken. And he said, the voice of the Lord is going to shake everything that can be shaken. And uh, verse 27 says, when everything that can be shaken has been shaken, then that which cannot be shaken will remain. I'm here to tell you today, today church, that everything that you see can be shaken. But the Word of God cannot be shaken. The Word of God will remain unchanged, immovable. The plan of God's not going to be altered. He will not lose control uh, over His prophetic voice. And what He has said will happen, will happen. There might be uh, plans of the enemy to dissuade God, but God's Word will abide forever. It is not going to change in this day that we live i said that the world that we knew is gone um, for example the political boundaries in the in the middle east have been changed i i realize that most people have a handle on this but and so if this is too elementary for you just hang on for a moment when i explain that isis or you some people just call them is some call them isil ISIS, it has to do with some Islamic extremists that have formed their own government. They do not have a country. They have begun to occupy, first of all, Syria, as Syria's government was under siege, and the United States said, well, let's help topple that 
government in Syria, they've been, uh, they have been, um, they have been uh, opposed to us, and they have, they have opposed us in what we do, and we really have suspected that they were Iraq's ally, and maybe even some of those weapons of mass destruction that had been supposed to be in Iraq, maybe were moved over to Syria. These things are all conjectured. So our commander in chief didn't want to send soldiers to Syria to overthrow that government, but we thought, well, wouldn't it be great if rebels overthrew that government? So we gave them our weapons to attack the, uh, the, ma the government in Damascus. And now they have used the weapons we gave them not only to attack Damascus, but to establish a presence in Iraq and the same territory that we went over and took away from the regime of Saddam Hussein now has fallen to these extremists. And so when we talk about ISIS and their power and all that they've been able to do militarily, we were the ones that gave them the guns to do it. I love the way you're shouting now. Our greatest enemy in the world are shooting at us with our own guns. Thank you very much. Doesn't sound scary to anybody? Political boundaries in the Middle East have been shaken. The Constitution of the United States is now under siege. I, I, I do not have the right words to say, and I want to be very careful with what I say. But I would almost, I would say that, I'll put it this way, I would almost have rather seen them write an entire new constitution than to cut the ones that we, the one that we've used for 225 years to shreds the way they have in the last two years. And uh, we, we find it easy target to blame the president the executive branch of government. But the ju judicial branch has to take equal blame for what's going on. I, what I'm telling you is basically today the Constitution of the United States does not have the rule of law in this country anymore. And that is serious. In other words, we don't have law. Um, this goes back two years. The president said, I have a law that I'm supposed to take deport undocumented aliens in this country, but I'm not going to do that. When you put your hand on the Bible and you say, okay, I swear to uphold the Constitution and, and, and of the United States, I'm going to keep the laws of this country. And now you say, you know what, I, I said that, but I don't mean that I'm not going to do it. You can pass all the laws you want to, but I'm not going to enforce them. We don't have a Constitution. When the judges and the Supreme Court ruled two years ago on what we like to call Obamacare, and they said, this is the ruling. They said, well, it's really not constitutional, but we're going to allow it. They're saying, we're ignoring the Constitution. I realize that most people understand that there is a Constitution. They really don't know what the Constitution says, so I'm going to tell you something that the Constitution says. The Constitution, of course, establishes three branches of government. One's for the executive branch, which is the president, the State Department, the Justice Department. That's all the executive branch. The president is over that, and the, he's the uh, commander-in-chief of the military. Then there's the legislative branch. That's the two houses of Congress, House of Representatives, the Senate. They are to enact laws. Their, their job is not to enforce laws. They are to enact laws. And then there's the judicial branch that is headed by the Supreme Court, but all the federal judges throughout the entire country fall into the same um, uh, article of the Constitution. And their job is not to enforce laws. Their job is not to create laws. Their job is to look at the laws that are being passed by Congress and determine whether or not those laws are uh, 
acceptable un under the Constitution. They rule on the constitutionality of the laws. The president does not decide whether the law is constitutional or not. He does not make a law. His job is to enforce the laws that are made. It, is it was established that way on purpose. And then the Constitution says expressly that the United States federal government has no other rights, responsibilities, or duties that is not expressly named in this Constitution. So just as a sideline, not to get into this today, read the Constitution sometime and find where you'll where it deals with marriage in the Constitution. Even one word about it. Even one word about it. That was intentionally left to the discretion of the states on purpose. And a ruling that deals with anything that's not expressly in the Constitution is unconstitutional. So the Constitution has been shaken. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. And obviously, I can tell you, and to nobody's surprise, it's no revelation to say that the moral values of our nation has been shaken. But the Word of God has not been shaken. And this is not the time for Christians to become fearful. We could look around us and see the things I'm talking about. ISIS is on the horizon. Our government has become outlaws. And the morality of our country is such that we are afraid of our own neighbors. This is not the time to become fearful. This is the time for the Christians to lift up their head. This is the day we've been saying it's coming. And now... It's coming. You know, we, we uh, told for years that after the uh, rapture of the church, there, there would be a new kingdom that would be created in the Middle East. And there it is. We already see the shadow of that kingdom before the rapture has even happened. So why would we be afraid? You know, five years ago, we didn't know where this was coming from, but we already see the image of the beast before the rapture has even happened. It's just telling us God was right. The word of God, the prophecies, they're coming to pass. They're being fulfilled. He was right. These things shouldn't cause us to fear. They ought to tell us, folks, it's time to get ready. What we've been saying is going to happen is happening. We told you that that kingdom... It was actually be known as a, as, a, as a prince. The leader of ISIS would, in the prophecy, called a prince. Said a prince that didn't have a kingdom yet would overthrow three governments. Isn't that amazing? Three governments. Would that be, let's see, Syria, Iraq, and Iran. Three countries. And when they do, the other nations of that region would become fearful of their power. And instead of fighting them, they would form allegiance to them. And now it's happening. In front of our very eyes, it is transpiring. It is coming to pass. Don't be scared. Be glad. It is upon us even now. I'm going to move ahead to this one more thing, and then I'm going to bring this to a conclusion today. I've probably given you more details about the government than you're planning to digest today already. So let me just come to this. You know, it actually, I'd, I'd heard a little talk about uh, what the prophetical teachers were calling the uh, blood moons, but, but I had not got a handle on what was happening. They have known this was coming for many, many years. 
And you may have heard people talk about the blood moons and uh, wondered what the significance was. And let me tell you what about the blood moons. The blood, so-called blood moons, because of certain uh, way that the light of the sun is reflect, refracted off of the earth and then shines on the moon behind us, it makes the uh, moon become dark and turn that reddish color. And it happens every now and then. Uh, not every year, generally, and uh, certainly not twice in a year, and certainly not twice a year, two years in a row, but it does happen. But these, it, it's a natural event. I mean, uh, they can predict when the next one's going to happen, and they can pre predict when they're going to take place and have predicted them for the next 100 years or, or more. They know when this has happened. It's a natural occurrence. Here is what's not coincidence about this story, that these four blood moons would happen in two years, two each in two years in a row. And that each time it would come on the first day of a major Jewish holiday. That's what's unusual. See, the Jews, um, we need to, if, if you want to know about what God's doing, always watch the Jews. Why? Well, because they're his people. Someone said, well, they, he, they rejected Jesus. Yes, they did, but God didn't reject them. They are being chastised because God chastises his children. Did you ever get spanked to take the woodshed, stay at, uh, wood, woodshed by your mama or your daddy because they loved you? And you may not have thought they were loving you when you were there, but you realize later that, that they did it because they loved you. And when the Lord takes you to the woodshed, he's done that with me. When he takes me to the woodshed, I know that it does it because he loves me. And that's the way it is with Israel. They've been at the woodshed. It's been a long visit to the woodshed. But, but God always uh, uses his people to reveal his will to the world. God spoke to Abraham and he said, I am going to bless you and I'm going to bless your seed and by your seed, shall all the nations of the world be blessed. And if God is going to bless the world today, he'll do it by blessing his people. That was so obvious. That was the whole deal about World War II and Hitler's onslaught against the Jews. He realized that some of these central powers across Israel financially were all Jewish. It caught his attention because God would bless the world financially even by prospering the Jews so much that the overflow blessed the entire world. And now God speaks to us today, the whole world, by speaking to and through Israel. And when he, the Jews are celebrating the feast, this has been um, a little more than a year ago right now, the first time on their feast, first day of the feast, the moon turned to blood. It should have been a message to them and a message to us. And so when that transpired and the political events that surrounded that in, ter in terms of the upheaval in the, in the uh, government in Damascus was the prelude to all that ISIS has done in the last two years began as the moon turned to blood just a little over a year ago. And the, the uh, trend continued. In the fall, the very next of uh, the great feast of the Jews, the first day of the feast, Jews celebrating the feast, and they look up, and lo and behold, the first day, the moon turns to blood again. You know, it's like always these, throughout the history, there have been these occurrences when the moon turns to blood. But when it happens four times in two years, all on the Jewish holiday, it's like seeing a caution light flashing on and light. You go down the highway, and you see that that uh, strobe light flashing on the road. It's telling you something's up. Something's up. Pay attention. And so then this last spring, the third of the Jewish feast in a row, the moon turned to blood. That, boy, that's significant, isn't it? I mean, three in a row. And each time something catastrophic 
happens on the international stage. The previous one last fall was when we extended the uh, agreement with Iraq, excuse me, Iran, about their nuclear program. We had given them a deadline, but they wouldn't acquiesce. We, all of our sanctions, we break down as if they had completely made agreement with the rest of the world, give them what they want, and they give us not one thing in return except the promise that they are going to erase the name Israel off the face of the map. That light just keeps flashing on and on. So this last spring, the third in a row. Now, the, the, uh, the uh, scientists know this to be true, and those that study such things, as, uh, astronomy knows that this is true. Um, this fall, the, the Jewish feast will begin and the day it begins, the moon will be turned to the blood, fourth one in a row. But here's something even more significant. The next day, after the moon turns to blood, the sun will have a full solar eclipse in the Middle East. Now, what the prophet said was, the sun will be darkened and the moon will turn to blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. And this fall, that's going to happen. And I'm going to tell you that each time, the last three, that, the, that we've experienced a blood moon, and each time it's been on a Jewish holiday, these last three blood moons, something catastrophic has happened in the world. There's been death involved with it. There's been the upheaval of nations involved with it. Everything that can be shaken is being shaken each time. And now we know that this fall is going to be the fourth one in a row. And it leads me to believe that something catastrophic is going to take place in September. Folks, that's just two months away. And I'm really expecting something catastrophic is going to happen. When not only the moon turns to blood, but the sun is darkened. Something catastrophic. So you say, well, what should we do? Should we dig a new shelter? Should we buy some extra bottles of water to put? I'm going to tell you what to do. Lift up your head for your redemption. Draw it nigh. And so, church, I'm going to quickly give you what we need to be doing in light of the things I'm talking about. I, I have, uh, we could talk a lot, about, um, a lot more about the things that are disconcerting, things that are shaken, things that are very frightening to the natural mind. But you, you understand what I'm telling you today. And I'm telling you that as a result of these things, the church needs to take a new position I don't believe that this is time for us to become politically activists. I believe it's time that we did what the scripture has told us to do. First of all, we need to be encouraged. Lift up your head. We need to be encouraged as people of God today. We need to take uh, seriously the fact that these days that we're living in are days that the Lord has earmarked his prophetically that the greatest days of the advancement of the kingdom of God will happen as a result of the judgment that is poured out upon the planet earth. This is not time to become frightened. This is a time to become emboldened. Lift up your head because redemption draweth nigh. Now, um, we all know that Jesus is the Redeemer. We talk about his passion as being the act of redemption, that he died for us and he rose up from the grave. We always talk about that as the, as the passion of Christ, the, the redemption. And, but I want you to understand, really, although he purchased us at Calvary and 
the purchase was confirmed when he rose up from the grave. The fact is, although we have been bought, we have really not yet been redeemed. A number of years ago, I had come, I don't remember how, but came into a small uh, windfall of money. And so um, my wife really loves furniture, old uh, an antique furniture. We don't have any of it, but she loves it. And uh, so they were, there was an auction where they were selling some antique furniture. And so I just pulled in there to see if I thought there's something that my wife may like. And, it, and the fact is, I thought she'd like everything. But I couldn't afford it. And so I just sat there and, and looked at that beautiful furniture being bid on and sold to other people. And, but they brought out three old uh, wingback chairs. And uh, they were beautiful, old. They needed a little restoration, but really beautiful. And I, I thought they were selling all three at one price. And so I thought I was really getting the bar. I started bidding. And um, so I, when I finished bidding and I was the last one, that's how you win an auction. You're the last one with your hand up. You, anyone can win an auction if they want to. All you do is raise your hand and leave it up until everybody else quits. So I thought I'd really got a bargain because I thought I bought all those chairs at one price. I found that that was each. But I'd already bid on it. So I, I, I told the, uh, the people back that was, was uh, taking my name and putting my number on the... Uh, on the purchase, I said, I've got to go back home and get my truck, and I'm going to come and pick these chairs up. I'll be right back. And they said, that'd be fine. And um, so I drove home, and I said, honey, I've bought you. Said, you're going to love this. And she said, what is it? I said, oh, I got you. I, you're going to love this. And uh, on the way there, I'm describing these wonderful chairs. She said, what'd you pay for them? And I just ignored this question. I just said, this is so, this is so cool. You're going to love it. Well, well, we went in and we stood in the back of the auction. And so now I take the receipt that they'd given me and go over to the office. And without Linda being able to pay attention, I paid three times what I thought I was going to pay for those chairs. And um, once I'd paid, I went back to where Linda was standing and, and I was supposed to drive around the back with my paid receipt now. See, I've already bought those chairs. I paid for them. But they were in the back, and I had to take my receipt back there. But much to my amazement, when I got back there, she said, Do you see that secretary sitting there? I said, Well, yeah, that's pretty. She said, I bought it. I said, You did what? She said, I bought that secretary right there. And I said, Okay, honey. Well, I'll go pay for it. And if you see anything you think looks good with it, well, you go ahead and, and, and bid on it. Get, get a good prize. And so I went back and I paid for the one she bought. And by the time I paid for it and got back, I said, let's go get it. She said, hey, you see that uh, wardrobe there? And I said, yeah. She said, that's ours too. I just bought it. I said, honey, go out to the truck and stay there. I'm going to pay for that. And so I drove the truck around the back. And I ended up having to make two trips to get everything. But my point of this illustration is when the auction was being held, we bought it. When I went to the office and gave them the money, it was paid for. But it wasn't redeemed until I took my receipt and drove back to the dock and got those men to help me load what I had bought and paid for into the truck. And so, folks, you have been bought. And you have been paid for. But I want you to know it's time to lift up your head because your redemption is getting close. The one who bought you the one who paid for you is getting ready to come back and get you. He's going to redeem you. 
He's going to take you into his arms and you're going to be in his presence forever. Hallelujah. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. Then will be brought to pass that saying, O oh, death, where is your victory? And grave, where is your sting? We're about to be taken. Hallelujah. It is not an imagination. It is not a hope so. It is a no so. We can lift up our heads with boldness in knowing that everything that has been promised us is about to come to pass. And we are going to be fully vindicated in the earth. We have been considered to be pilgrims and strangers in this land. And our very uh, mindset has been questioned. These people are crazy looking for a city who has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. But in that day when he comes and he redeems us, we will become possessors of that inheritance and it will be forever ours because of his greatness and his glory. Hallelujah. Um, th this is uh, the work of the Lord, the manifestation of Jesus, glorifying the church. He's not coming back for a church that's broken down and fallen. He's not going to come back for a church that is laden with sin and oppressed and addicted. He's coming back for a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. He's coming back for a church that identifies with God, hallelujah, that has the mark and the seal of the Holy Spirit in us. He's coming back to vindicate us before our enemies and everything that we have said and claimed because of the Word of God will be proven and uh, concluded and we will be vindicated before those of our enemies. That is why these are our greatest days this is the greatest day in the history of the church when God shall reveal his glory in us. Can you say amen? I'd like for you to stand with me this morning if you would.